Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. Uh, my name is Will Kaufman. I'm a sophomore at the college studying history and literature, and I'm a member of the JFK Jr. Forum Committee. Uh, before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on both the park, the park side and the JFK Street side of the Forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park out there. Uh, please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming the Forum's Director of Membership, Alex Chan. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Alex Chan, and I am a senior at Harvard College studying government, and I'm one of the directors of membership of the Forum Student Committee. Tonight, we have the distinct honor of welcoming back Professors Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Zablat to the Forum. Professors Levitsky and Zablat are the authors of the New York Times bestseller, How Democracies Die, and are some of the most renowned scholars of democracy, both here at home and across the world. They've just published a new book, The Tyranny of the Minority, and tonight we have the wonderful opportunity to engage in what I know will be a lively and fruitful discussion on the state of democracy and what we can do to right the ship. And having been a student in both of their classes before, I know that their insights are always valuable and you all have the distinct honor of not having an essay or an exam to write at the end of this. Stephen Levitsky is the David Rockefeller Center, David Rockefeller Professor of Latin American Studies and Professor of Government, and he's also the director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. His research interests include democracy and authoritarianism, political parties and institutions in Latin America. In total, he's contributed to more than 12 books, including the one we are discussing tonight. Daniel Ziblatt is an Eaton Professor of the Science of Government at Harvard and the new director of the Center for European Studies, also here at Harvard. His research focuses on European politics, democracy, historical political economy, and state building. He has written five books and was also elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences earlier this year. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by Tiziana Deering. She is the host of Radio Boston on WBUR, and in addition to her work there, she has contributed to a number of other news outlets around the region and country. And prior to her work at WBUR, she was a professor of social work at the Boston College School of Social Work. She has won many awards, including the Boston Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Award and received an MPP here at the Harvard Kennedy School in 2000. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming professors Stephen Levitsky, Daniel Ziblatt, and Tiziana Deering. great to be here. Uh, just let everybody in the... Hi. It's so nice to see you. I'm sorry, that just caught me off guard for a second. It's great to see Marshall Gans here in the front row. Um, just to give you a moment to let you know what to expect, we're going to have a conversation for a little less than 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions. And as a host of a live radio show, I'm really good at making sure you actually ask questions. So we'll do that in the last 20 minutes. It's an absolute delight to be here. Um, there were like 13 different ways I wanted to start this conversation, and I'm going to start with the cheesiest one. Uh, and I'm going to turn it to you, Steve, and just say, why'd you write the book? Why did we write the book? Um, the first book, How Democracies Die, we wrote because we study democratic breakdown elsewhere in the world, and we felt when we, with the emergence of Donald Trump that this is a movie we'd seen before, that it's a movie that doesn't end well, and that Americans needed to know about that. So the book was mainly a description of how democracies can get in trouble and how they've gotten in trouble elsewhere so that Americans could begin to see the warning signs. But after we published the book, over and over and again, we got questions from journalists, from the public. H how do we get out of this mess? And so this second book is an effort to dive deeper into the question of how we got into the mess and, and to think more seriously about how to get out. OK, so as a journalist, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stipulate for a moment we're going to work in the mess space. And I'll push back on the mess space a little bit later. But 
given that that's sort of the core hypothesis of the book, we'll, we'll start there. The core hypothesis is a mess? That, that we're in a mess that needs to be gotten out of. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of start there. But there's this other piece that I want to make sure that we draw forward. And, and then we talked about this in advance. There are a couple of chapters in the book that I want us to dive into a little bit and then use them to hold up to the light some of the moments that we're in now. Um, but Daniel, one of the things that's really striking is this idea that the challenge we are facing is negotiating our way through, to or through, you pick the prepositional phrase, um, becoming a multiracial democracy. And that that seems to be the moment of challenge. And that was striking to me because you don't necessarily present optimism that the United States will succeed in that, although you do present optimism that a democracy can succeed in that. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, I, I do think actually we're optimistic about that. So we can come back to that. But you know, we open the book with a description of two different days, uh, January 6th, which we all know what happened January 6th, 2021, but also the day of January 5th, 2021, which a lot of people forget about. What happened on January 5th, 2021, was a day where uh, you had two senators elected from the South, uh, from Georgia, an African-American, a Jewish-American. And so this was a remarkable day. If you kind of think back to that, that evening, you know, this is a historic moment. This was a moment that civil rights activists had been working for for generations. And so this represented, if we think back to that, a kind of moment of promise of multiracial democracy. And so to have then within 24 hours this assault on the Congress where the very foundations of democracy seem to be fundamentally challenged was, was a striking juxtaposition. And I think what's so useful about thinking those two days back to back in, in, in a pair is they represent both two different strands in American political life. I mean, there's a temptation to think you know, that our history has always been terrible and that we're in, a, we're in a crisis and there's all bad. There's also a temptation to kind of think that you know, there's this wonderful future. And I think actually both of these strands are in our, in our history and in our present. And so really the struggle that we're trying to describe in the book is the struggle between these two forces. Um, and we think that ultimately, I mean, part of the, the diagnosis that we make is that our institutions are actually making this transition more difficult. But there really is an incredible moment of promise. I mean, we, we're a very diverse society, uh, but, and really for the first time in our history, there are overwhelming majorities of Americans, if you believe opinion polls, and especially among younger Americans, who support the notion of political equality for all people of all backgrounds. And Steve, you really present towards the end of the book the idea that this is actually a do or die moment for multiracial democracy in the United States. Well, I don't want to over dramatic, I don't want to over dramatize in the sense that if Trump wins the 2024 election, we're going to slide into fascism. I don't think that is true. I think uh, we th there will be future moments and future rounds of political conflict and political struggle, no matter who wins the 2024 election. So I think it's, it's sometimes a mistake to think that everything, it's easy to describe it this way, but it's a mistake to think that everything rides on this moment. But it is true that uh, given demographics and political preferences in this country, we, for the, as, as Daniel was saying, for the first time ever in this country, in the 21st century, a majority of Americans consistently support the idea of, a, of living in a racially diverse society and are supportive of policies aimed at racial equality. That was, it wasn't even true when I was in graduate school. It's only true in the 21st century. But, if, so, but, but we can only survive as a democracy in a multiracial society uh, if, that, if that majority is, is, is hurt. So, in the future, given the majority preferences for multiracial democracy, given um, the, the demographics of this country, if we're not going to be a multiracial democracy, we're going to be something less than democracy. All right, so that's kind of our frame, right? That's the, that's the context in which the, the, the chapters and the ideas in this book unfold. And we're, we're not gonna go chapter by chapter through it, although I have a couple of times and, and, and there's a ton in it. It's one of those where as you're reading it, your brain's kind of going bah, 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 and lots of things as you go through. There are two chapters I do wanna focus on, but before we do that, I, I wanna talk about losing and the losers, right? Which is, you know, the first chapter, we open with the fear of losing. And I think it's an important threshold, not only because in politics of the last, let's say, four to six years, this concept of the loser has taken on a 
I, I, I mean, it's a word, right, that's in our lexicon now. But also I think it is important that you lay out both how important it is, the willingness to lose and walk away peacefully is so central to the functioning of a democracy, but also how much the stakes change when one group of stakeholders see the idea of a loss as a fundamentally existential threat, Daniel. Yeah, so we, we provide some criteria for how to think about what counts as a politician or political party or political leaders who are committed to democracy or loyal to democracy. And we lay out three criteria. We say in order to be a politician or a political leader committed to democracy, you have to accept elections, win or lose. And this challenge of losing is really key. Uh, and this is really the essence of democracy, right? But there's also a couple other criteria. Uh, one has to also, if one's committed to democracy, not use violence to try to gain power or to hold on to power. And then also critically, if you're a political leader, you have to, a mainstream political leader in a position of responsibility, you have to be able to distance yourself from your own allies who engage in those kinds of behaviors. And so what we have witnessed over the last uh, 30 years, I would say, is increasingly major elements within the Republican Party in particular. I mean, these are criteria that apply to all parties, all politicians left and right, but within the Republican Party, who seem to be violating all three of those criteria. And so this is very worrying because a democracy can't survive unless you have at least two parties who are committed to democracy. If you have a, one, at least one, one of those parties, one major player uh, who is willing to violate those rules, who is willing not to accept election losses, democracy is going to be fundamentally unstable. I mean, this is really clear from the cases that we look at historically, uh, both in Latin America and in Europe over the course of the 20th century. So what, what drives a party into that condition is, is really a fundamental question. And so we, we make the case that what has happened over the course of the last 40, 50 years is the Republican Party has increasingly lost the ability to win majorities. And this is driven by kind of major realignments that took place in American society. I mean, essentially, Amer and to put it very briefly, American society changed dramatically since the 1960s, has become much more diverse, ethnically, culturally, religiously, and the Republican Party has not. The Republican Party has remained an overwhelmingly uh, white party. And so uh, this has had two real consequences. One, there's increased fear that, uh, well, first of all, you can't, it's hard to win if you're not willing to appeal to broader segments of the electorate. And number two, it makes you, if you, if you fear that you are, your whole way of life is under siege, as some Republican voters do feel, then you're going to be existentially fearful about any kind of political change. And this drives parties to radicalization. So uh, moments for pushback here. I mean, we're, we're sitting at the Harvard Kennedy School. One would certainly say that historically, uh, Joseph Kennedy was not willing to lose. And we have plenty of good evidence that there were shenanigans going on in the 1960 presidential election to ensure that Jack Kennedy won. So what is it so unique about the Republican Party in the last 30 years? I mean, uh, you come out hard on this party. As a journalist, I gotta ask you, it doesn't seem to me that necessarily in American history, even in my lifetime, one party particularly has a corner on any of the phenomena yeah. you're talking about. Are well, you're right. I mean, the Democratic Party behaved in very similar ways in the 1860s and the 1870s. <laughs> right? I gave you 1960, very, in all fairness. I'll get back there. But to begin with, the, the best parallel in the United States is, is the Reconstruction Era and the Democratic Party. So it's not, this is not a, a monopoly that the Republican Party has, but very similar phenomena. With Reconstruction, you get the massive and, and an almost immediate enfranchisement of African Americans in the US South. African Americans are an absolute majority of the electorate in, I think, three states. They're a near majority in several other states. So suddenly, almost overnight, the Democratic Party is faced with the, the fact that it's it, a, a huge electoral challenge. It loses its electoral supremacy. But more important than that, its primary constituents face an existential threat. Not only is the, is the Democratic Party's electoral dominance threatened in the 1860s and 1870s, but the entire racial order in the South is, is threatened. And so many white Democrats in the South at that time felt like their, uh, their entire social existence was at stake. And so the party turned to terrorism, to electoral fraud, and to nearly a century of authoritarianism. There's been nothing uh, like that by either party since then. Uh, but I do, I do take issue with the fact there's a, there's a huge difference between Joe Kennedy and a party that uh, 
80% of which in the US Congress refused in, for six weeks after the uh, November 2020 election to accept publicly that Joe Biden had won. That's not happened in either party in any of our lifetimes, right? The cardinal rule, as Daniel pointed out, the cardinal rule of democracy is accepting the results of election win the or lose. Thing. Hmm? The, the losing, losing thing. Accepting the results of elections win or lose. The vast bulk of the Republican Party refused to do that. It also violated the third tenet that Daniel um, um, mentioned in that it clearly not only tolerated but protected Donald Trump after he had uh, tried to overturn the results of an election. So a clearly, un objectively authoritarian act, the Republican Party still refused to break from it. Right? All of this discussion about whether Trump can or should be a candidate in 2024, all of that would have been avoided had Republicans in the Senate simply convicted him for over trying to overturn an election illegally. There is nothing in the 20th century by either the Democratic or the Republican Party that comes even close to what happened in late 2020, early 2021. And can, let, me, let me just say, I mean, the point here is to provide a set of criteria to evaluate politicians and political leaders. And so one can then use these criteria to analyze politics. And so, you know, I welcome the kind of effort to say that other parties are violating these rules. Parties of the left in Latin America have violated these rules in recent years. Uh, parties of the party of the, at the moment, our diagnosis is these criteria are being violated more, certainly more so by the Republican Party than the Democratic Party, but no party has a monopoly on this. I mean, this is, and it's often asymmetric, but the danger, of course, is that this, you know, we, we talked about this in our first book, this has a spiraling effect on our politics. When we get into these kinds of conversations where each side thinks the other side is a major threat to democracy, we begin to hear this kind of rhetoric on the Republican side as well about the Democratic Party. But if we use these criteria, we can then look at facts and make judgments about it. So um, there are a couple of places I'd like to go from there. I want to come back to a metric that you used where you, and I apologize, it is a nonprofit organization that looks at, uh, did a measuring of the behavior of 210 members of Congress across five factors. The Republican uh, Accountability Project. Yes. Yeah, and, right. and, and this is where those numbers come from that you were just pushing yeah. back on me. So talk a little bit more about that, Steve. Well, the Republican Accountability Project are, um, these are never Trumpers. These are conservatives who broke early on with Donald Trump and have been working very actively and really quite heroically to build a broad uh, multipartisan, bipartisan, I guess, coalition against to defeat Trumpism. And one of the things that they did, they have a website you can go to, is they went back and looked at the public statements of every, and they have a, they have a um, this is fitting for the Kennedy School. They, they actually have report cards and grades for all Republican members of Congress, House and Senate in their behavior, particularly since, uh, since 2020. And one of the things they did is they went back and looked at the public statements of every Republican member of Congress in, with respect to the 2020 election. And they found that really only a handful, fewer than 20%, publicly accepted the results of the election and publicly accepted that Joe Biden had won, which again, cardinal rule of democracy. Okay, um, I'm actually gonna pause for a moment. I'm actually gonna sit us all back in our chairs a little bit. I'm mindful that the people in the wings on both sides are all starting forward and forward more as we scooch forward and forward more to see each other. Genuine question here and the follow-up. Is there a similar organization that is following the Democratic Party and any newly emerging parties and following similar metrics? And if not, should there be, if there is a tendency now to break that egg, will there not now always be a tendency to break those eggs for whomever is in power? Daniel. Well, I mean, sure, there should be. I mean, I don't think, you know, that, and that's partly why we wrote the book is to provide the criteria for people to understand this. I mean, look, we're scholars of Latin America and Europe. Primarily, that's sort of what we did for most of our career. And so we, these are not criteria that we invented looking at the right. Republican Party. These right. are criteria that we developed based on our own studies of these other parts of the world. And what motivated us was the recognition that this is something that's happening here. And, it, and, it, and it's incredibly dangerous. And it's, and it's incredibly tempting also to kind of say, well, you know, this is just normal politics. These guys look like normal politicians. 
you know, the men and women wear suits, they kind of sound like normal politicians, nothing really has changed, I can continue to go about my life, but our, our point is really to say no, that these criteria should be applied to all parties. So, you know, whether this will happen in the Democratic Party, I mean, I don't know, I don't, you know, I'm, I, don't, I actually think the Democratic Party leadership has been incredibly responsible. I mean, this is a very different case, but the, the senator from New Jersey who's been accused of corruption and so on, Bob much Davis. less, I mean, it's a serious problem, but it's, you know, this is not organizing an attack on the on the Congress, and you know his colleagues are separating themselves with him. I mean, for a much lesser kind of thing. That and this is something that you know we have not seen on the Republican side. Okay, so there's one more piece, on the, sort of the behaviors that you look for that the two of you have not, or I or I haven't given you an opportunity to emphasize as strongly that I think is important in these building blocks, which is the coalition across lines to essentially shut down authoritarian behavior. Uh, and you use the example, for example, of in the investigations after January 6th, a Lynn Cheney, for example, who yes. as a Republican crosses over and forms an alliance with uh, members of the committee on the Democratic side to say, we have to shut this behavior down, call it what it is. But this willingness to form alliances across interest and across lines in order to shut down authoritarian behavior is one last building block that the two of you, Steve, say it is necessary in a functioning democracy if we're going to build these clear walls to stop authoritarianism from emerging. Absolutely. Um, again, it, 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 there aren't an a, a autocrat, even a popular demagogue like Trump cannot kill a democracy by himself. Um, very few single individuals or, or small groups can kill a democracy by themselves. It requires the cooperation of mainstream politicians, usually from one's own party or one's own political flank. And if you look at democratic breakdowns, whether it's in Spain in the 1930s, in Chile in the early 70s, in Venezuela more recently, in Turkey, it is always the fact that authoritarians have this tacit support uh, sometimes just the, the quiet acquiescence of a set of mainstream politicians. And so the role of mainstream politicians, the, the, the folks in the, in the suits, the ones who are inside the Congress, not the ones who are attacking Congress, the ones who are inside the Congress building, is absolutely vital. Now, our politicians weren't trained for this. They, they haven't been in this sort of democratic crisis before. They may not be fully aware of the or they should be by now, but they, they may not have been aware by 2020 of the consequences of just sort of going along and, well, you know, Trump is good for my career, um, but it's very, very costly. And, um, you know, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, for example, did the right thing. They behaved in, in the way that mainstream politicians must behave if democracies are going to survive a crisis. Can, ahead, can I just Daniel. give two yeah. examples of this? So in our book, we describe France in the 1930s, February 6, 1934, which was a day, uh, you know, France at this point was the oldest democracy in Europe. Uh, on February 6, there was a vote going on inside the parliament building in the middle of Paris. There was this gathering of veterans and right-wing militia groups outside the parliament building who were disgruntled, disaffected, and angry, and they attacked the parliament building. The police showed up on horses. These guys were armed with sticks and clubs and some with long sticks with razor blades at the ends to cut the horses' legs. They tried to break into the parliament building. The members of parliament fled the building. Eventually, the whole thing came to an end. Dozens of people were killed and injured. Um, and the, the democracy survived, but was greatly weakened because what it turned out was the key thing was how did the mainstream politicians in that scenario respond? And after investigation, it turned out there was many center-right, the Republican Federation was the conservative party in France at this time, members of parliament who knew what was going to happen. They helped orchestrate the attack. Um, and they stood by and they blocked an investigation. Nobody was ever held to account. And six years later, when the Nazis invaded, and this brought French democracy to the ground, there were a whole bunch of these guys who were never put to brought to justice, who formed their own organization, and were recruited into the new Vichy government. So by not holding these guys to account, this greatly weaken the immune system of the French political system. So this, is, this really makes a difference. Give you another story. So in Brazil, just very recently, Bolsonaro, who is the, the sort of Trump of the tropics, um, uh, uh, was president, very similar rhetoric, and you know, in some, some instances even worse. You know, he says he supports you know, military murders and so on, and, and, and embraced the, the military coup history of Brazil. 
He was elected, he was in office, he was voted out. He didn't think he lost the election. Some of his supporters attacked government buildings. Similar kind of event, this happens. Um, and the, the, his party allies, rather than rallying to his defense, uh, came out and essentially said that, no, the election is over. This was unacceptable. And, and Bolsonaro is, is now banned from running for office. And, and Brazilian democracy has survived and is greatly strengthened from this. So again, the key point is the mainstream politicians play the decisive role. And we need to learn from these other experiences for our own country. All right, now I'm gonna pause for just a second and I know you're not expecting this. We'll go to the mics a little bit later, but I wanna take a second and I wanna ask the audience, kind of, I wanna do a quick shout out of the, the topics that are on your mind and in the remaining time for the panel are things that you came to hear about. So I just need four or five people to give me quick shouts from the audience. I actually mean it, you've been to concerts, you know how to do this. <laughs> shout out, no, no hands, just shout. Okay, keep going. Religion, McCarthy shut down. Give me one more. How do we get out of it? How do we get out? Okay, great. So we're going to start with McCarthy shut down, all right? Um, and we're going to do two things. One, Stephen, with that heavy sigh, Steve, with that heavy sigh in mind, <laughs> you're going to tell us why the microcosm of the McCarthy shutdown is, in fact, not an example of the tyranny of the minority. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I get, I've been getting this question over and over again from journalists, which is why I sighed. Uh, and I don't have a good answer to it, Karen. Um, people keep saying, well, isn't, isn't the, the fact that a small number of Republicans in the House is, uh, are lead, lead us to a government shutdown, isn't that tearing the minority? It's really not. It's much more a, a product of the radicalization of the Republican Party. There is no, uh, there, there are more than enough votes in the House to pass a budget, there are, and there's nothing stopping, um, there's no rule stopping McCarthy from voting with Democrats to, to, to pass a budget. But the, the minute that McCarthy does that, votes, crosses the floor and votes with Democrats, he will lose his job. And so it is the radicalization of the Republican Party more than any rule, and we can talk about the filibuster and other truly institutional mechanisms of minority rule in the US. But in this case, it is primarily the radicalization of the Republican Party and the internal dynamics of a party that is really no longer committed to upholding a, a functioning democracy that's causing the problem. Not, this is not an instance of minority rule. At the same time, there is a line in the book where you talk about not taking a clear line against authoritarianism, but instead being wishy-washy and that that's one of the places that a party will fall down. And you actually say, I won't get the words exactly right, but Daniel, you actually say Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy weren't necessarily anti-democratic, they just chose to prioritize their careers instead. And that rings in my ears even as I hear Steve say what he just said. So maybe square, maybe bring, come back full circle on that. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, I, I, this I think builds on Steve's point, which is that the party has been radicalized and in many ways the, the party leaders are enthralled to, to Trump. I mean, that's part of what's going on. And so, and they're- To and they're, Trump or to the people who support well, Trump? Well, yeah, to their, to their, to their al party allies who, are, who want Trump to be president again. I mean, so to this, this kind of core radicalized base. So the question is, why is the Republican Party doing this? And I think tyranny of minor, the tyranny of the minority is implicated because part of our explanation for why this is happening is our institutions, and we can get to this, are, have created a situation where the Republican Party doesn't have to win majorities to win the national presidency. So the party itself has been distorted in this way to give rise to a kind of party that in the Congress is holding somebody like Kevin McCarthy kind of hostage. So, so our institutions are kind of trickling down to affect uh, the, the radicalization of the Republican Party. So I want to pull out this word base now because yeah. I think it's a way that we can begin to address the shout out that had to do with religion as well. Because in a later chapter in the book, um, you talk about a capture of the Republican Party. And one of the things that's striking in it is that you do talk about, my words not yours, white Christian nationalism and the, the, the phenomenon of uh, a, a white Christian movement in the United States and how it aligns. And in fact, this alignment between uh, the way our government functions to prioritize small states becomes 
Christian and rural states become Republican states become a minority phenomenon, Steve. And maybe that's a piece of the religion question. And since religion woman out there is nodding at me, I think I might be on the right track. And so I'll turn it to you. Look, um, I'm a Jewish guy, so I'm not I'm going to only get so far talking about religion. But um, I'm the, Catholic, I'll help. The, I don't think this is about religion. I think this is much more about identity. And uh, we can talk about the party's transformation, or you can talk about the institutions. I think two, basically two things have happened at the same time that have proven to be a very, very dangerous cocktail. One, which Daniel mentioned earlier, is the transformation of the Republican Party. The Republican Party was a minority party in the middle part of the 20th century. Uh, uh, you know, during the New Deal period, the Republican Party was clearly a minority party. And it did what parties are supposed to do when they lose. It tried to expand its base. And what it did, what its, part, what its leaders did, uh, and they debated this for a good decade, was as the civil rights movement took off, particularly in the South, and as Southern whites, who were overwhelmingly Democrats, began to grow uneasy with the Democratic Party's very gradual evolution on civil rights. As the Democratic Party slowly became the party of civil rights, the Republicans looked at white voters in the South and said, that's a, that's a potential constituency for us. And they spent 20 years very self-consciously appealing to that constituency, appealing, beginning with Goldwater in 64, continuing with, with Nixon, all the way through Reagan, who, who added the appeal to evangelical Christians. So you know, evangelical Christians had been evenly, evenly distributed between the two parties as, uh, as recently as the 1970s. They voted for Jimmy Carter over, over Ford in 76. But beginning with Reagan, the party started to explicitly appeal not only to uh, whites who were uncomfortable with the civil rights revolution, but to evangelical Christians. And it did it well. Over 20 years, and really over 30 years, it brought the vast majority of Southern whites from the Democratic Party into the Republican Party, and it made the Republican Party a majority party in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and, and by basically bringing racially conservative and, and evangelical whites into the Republican Party fold. The problem is that the America didn't stand still. America continued to evolve in the 21st century. And so being America's white Christian party, again, I think this is much more about identity than it is religion. But being America's white Christian party was a good electoral deal in the 1980s and the 1990s. It was not a good deal in the early 21st century, why they started to lose. So uh, let's pick it up from there. And there are like three different threads that I want to follow, but I am mindful of time. And our last shout out was, you know, how do we get out of it, right? I think to do the how do we get out of it, Daniel, we need to do the last part that you alluded to as well, which is the piece where you lay out some other structures like the way the Supreme Court works, like the Senate filibuster, you know, judicial oversight in the Supreme Court, the Senate filibuster, uh, and, and uh, you, the Electoral College, and the presentation that the two of you make in the book of how they reinforce minority rule, and therefore what you would have changed. Maybe pick that up. Yeah, so I mean, to go back to the opening question of we're in this mess, how did we get here? I mean, I think we spent a lot of time understanding the demographic trends and dynamics and race, religion, and so on that have played into that. That's, that's really one big part of the story. But the second big part of the story that we tell in our book, really the second half of the book, is institutional. Yeah. And we, we make the case that this process, that our institutions are making the situation worse. They're not helping. They're actually making the situation, and our constitution in particular. I mean, and so, you know, our, inst our, inst our constitution was a, is a brilliant document. It was written in a pre-democratic era. Um, and it's a document that for, throughout its history has over, always overrepresented political minorities. And so you think of the Senate, which has always overrepresented small states, often rural states. The Electoral College, as a result of that, tends to overrepresent small states and rural states. And the federal judiciary, because the president picks the 
federal, the Supreme Court, the Senate confirms it, the federal judiciary always has always represented rural and small states. So th these are my political minorities. The rural and small states, as we know, are less, there's fewer people living in those states than in urban states. Now, for most of our history, that has been a bias and an unfair system, but it hasn't really had a partisan effect. So through the whole period that Steve was just describing, there was urban Democrats, there was rural Democrats, there was urban Republicans, there was rural Republicans. But part of the shift that has taken place is that today, as we all know, urban areas are primarily Democratic and rural and small town areas are primarily Republican. So this bias in our constitution, which always represented, overrepresented for most of our history, has overrepresented rural minorities, now re overrepresents Republican minorities. So the Republican Party is a minority party, in a sense, nationally. Um, and so what this means, this has a couple of consequences. Uh, because what this means is that you can now uh, win power, again, as I've said before, the presidency, without winning a majority of the vote. As the and this primarily has benefited the Republican Party. In principle, this is a problem because it's unfair, because it always allows minorities. I mean, this happens from time to time that the loser of the popular vote wins the presidency. But this is now increasingly benefiting the Republican Party. And this has a kind of nasty, I mean, it's bad on its own terms, just sort of in terms of fairness. I mean, in every facet of our life, we always think that the, you know, you go out, decide to go out to dinner. My daughter and wife are here tonight. If we decide where to go out to dinner, we have a little vote. And you know, the more people say we want to go have Chinese food, we go get Chinese food. But for some reason, in this one domain of our political life, we think it's OK. That's that, not how my family works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So you have good, good instincts on this. Because, you, because in, our, in, our, in our political system, you, know, you can lose the popular vote and yet win the presidency. No other country in the world has this arrangement. We're the only country in the world uh, a presidential democracy where you can elect the president and, and we can become president by losing the vote. So we have this system that has always been unfair in this way, but it now benefits Republicans. And the, the danger, I think, for us is both that this allows one party to entrench itself in power, but the second danger, and we really try to make the case for this, is that this has this radicalizing effect on, it, it exacerbates this radicalization that Steve has just talked about. Because what it means is that if you don't have to win majorities, and you're under great pressure from your base to kind of double down on the old strategy, you're just going to double down on the old strategy. So, you know, Donald Trump lost the popular vote in 2016 and 2020. Do any of us really think that without the Electoral College, the Republican Party would be once again following this strategy? The only reason that this kind of doubling down on this strategy is because there's, there's a possibility of winning power without winning majorities. I'm going to call time out for yeah. just a second to say to the audience that in a few minutes I'm going to begin turning to the microphone. So if you want to begin thinking about a well-formulated question and turning to mics that are, uh, pardon me for pointing, there and there on the floor and there and there on the risers, will begin coming to you soon. So excuse me for that time Yeah, out. so this is tyranny and, of the minority. And before you go on from that, I, I want to, and we'll, we'll get to the proposals in a moment, but yeah. I do want to say pendulum swing. Yeah. We know that the urbanization of populations is actually a global ph phenomenon, and we'll continue to move in that direction. Thought experiment is, should that bit pendulum begin to swing back in the other direction? Uh, your proposals are to address that, right, and, and fix that problem. What happens then? The pendulum swings back in the other direction. Yeah. In the thought experiment, do we then say, uh-oh, we shouldn't have fixed the problem? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's unfair. Nobody thinks it's fair. I mean, I would like to hear the argument for why it's fair that if you lose the vote, that you should gain power. Okay. That it can benefit Democrats, it has in the past. It can benefit Republicans, it has, it does at the moment. Our, our criticism of it is, is not the partisan point, but it's simply the point that this is an unfair system and it has, it's put us in this very vulnerable position today. Okay, so Steve, and the three things. I'm sorry, you, you can add that point, and then the three big buckets of things in that last chapter, the okay. fixes. So urbanization is happening everywhere. There, in all Western democracies, we're seeing a reaction against uh, uh, growing diversity. But in all other democracies, majorities effectively rule. One of the, one of the things that we discovered in in researching and writing this book is just how alone the United States stands among established democracies. In most democracies, party forces that garner electoral majorities govern, and parliamentary majorities are able to pass regular legislation. It is not the case in any other established democracy in the world that 41 votes out of 100 can systematically and permanently thwart the will of 59 legislatures in a body. It the is Senate not, there, Right. There is no other democ presidential democracy on earth where the loser of the election 
can then win control of the executive. Um, and there's no other established democracy in the world where uh, Supreme Court justices have lifetime, truly lifetime tenure on the court. Every other established democracy has either a retirement age or term limits um, that limit the degree to which justices can, can just can grow divorced from public opinion. Um, and so we discovered in researching this book, and we, there's an entire chapter on this, that the United States really stands as not only an outlier, but a laggard in terms of empowering majorities. Oh, you wanted to ask about the reforms? So what we call for, and, and this um, I think strikes some as somewhat radical, but is definitely not, is a set of reforms that would bring us in line with other established democracies in the world. It would make us look a little bit more like Canada, Germany, and New Zealand. Um, we call for abolition of the Electoral College, so an establishment of direct popular vote, like every other presidential democracy in the world. We call for a set of reforms, ideally including making it a constitutional, uh, an establishing a constitutional right to vote. Most democracies have a constitutional right to vote. We never have and still do not. But even short of that, a series of measures that make it easy for people to vote. Have election day be a Sunday or a holiday. Have, it, uh, have people be, citizens be automatically registered when they turn 18. These are things that exist in almost every other established democracy in the world. Almost every other democratic government wants to make it, tries to make it easy for people to vote, right? In a democracy, voting is, is, is really at the core. It should be easy for people to vote. Really, only in the United States, among established democracies, is it actually kind of a pain to register and to vote. So we have a series of reforms that would hopefully make it easier to get to the ballot box. We also propose reforms that would allow majorities to govern. Um, we, we call for elimination of the Senate filibuster. That may well be something that benefits the Republicans in the short run more than the Democrats. And we've had Senate Democrats tell us to our, well, to our face over Zoom that that's not a good idea. But um, in a democracy, it's really important that legislative majorities for regular legislation be able to govern. And one of the reasons why uh, you know, levels of public distrust and public discontent with our democracy have risen dramatically in the last 20, 24 years. There are a bunch of reasons for that, but one of them is that there are a whole bunch of policies and laws that large, consistent majorities of Americans want that don't get through the damn Senate because of the filibuster. Gun control is one of them. Uh, voting rights is another one. So we call, call for elimination of the filibuster. Uh, we also call for an expansion of the size of the House of the Representatives. It's been, a, is it a century? Mm -hmm. Since we've, we've expanded, the popu U.S. population has, has increased dramatically, uh, so the number of representatives should also increase in line with that. Um, and then we call for, uh, for judicial reform, we call for term limits, either 12 or 18 year term limits on the Supreme Court rather than um, lifetime tenure. Okay, I have a whole uh, basket full of questions. Can, you, can, I, can I say one thing before we turn it over to the, to well, the audience? I don't know that we have anyone to turn it over to okay, well yet. Then, oh, we do. Can All I right, just so one yes. very quick point, which is Wait. that these, so these reforms may sound you know, radical or unrealistic, but one of the points that, we, that really we want people to come away with is that there's a great American tradition of making our constitution more democratic. I mean, this is, you know, our Constitution, as I said at the beginning, was not a democratic document when it was written, and people admire and love the Constitution in a lot of ways, and, but what, part of what they love and admire about it is that it's changed over time, and it's become more democratic. Women gain the right to vote. Uh, we elect our senators rather than appointing them, and all of these reforms are part of the American tradition, and what we've stopped doing in the last 50 years is we've stopped doing that. And, and if we want to understand why we are where we are today, we have to contend with the fact that we sort of have given up on, on this idea that's part of, essential to who we are as Americans. And so we need to, we need to embrace this tradition again. All right, we're gonna start here. You were the first woman to stand. What's your name and what's your question? And if you could try to keep your question tight and an actual question, that'd be fantastic, yeah. thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Adelaide, and this is a question for Professor Levitsky. I was in your Comparative Politics in Latin America course last semester. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> what lessons do you think the United States can learn from recent Latin American elections, especially those in Argentina and Mexico, when uh, looking to preserve our own democracy and prevent the tyranny of the minority? 
Okay, by the way, tight and a real question, so well done. I think far and away, and I'm going to uh, repeat ourselves a, a little bit, but far and away the best lesson is to be drawn from recent events in Brazil. Again, Brazil, two years after the United States, Brazil seemed for a while to follow in parallel with the United States. We elected Trump in 2016. Brazilians elected a, a far-right, right-wing populist, Jair Bolsonaro, in 2018. Uh, Trump was, a, was a, a pretty inept president, and that cost him public support, and he had trouble getting reelected. Bolsonaro was a pretty inept president, handled COVID very poorly, lost public support, had trouble getting reelected. Neither one was willing uh, to just accept defeat and walk away. So that was a, threw both countries into crisis. In the United States, you know the story. In Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro tried to overturn the election, um, but every major right-wing politician in the country, everyone, the Kevin McCarthy of Brazil, the Mitch McConnell of Brazil, the uh, Ron DeSantis of Brazil, all of them, on election night, within hours, came out and said, Lula, the opposition candidate, won the election. We look forward to working with him. And that's the end. Um, and as, as Daniel said, after, in Brazil's version of January 6th, February 8th, was it? No, January 8th, um, all right-wing politicians immediately denounced the, the violence. There was no talk about uh, uh, you know, Antifa or anything like that. Um, and leaders of the Brazilian right were, the, were at that forefront of calls to investigate the, uh, the, the violence. Um, so Republican politicians could, could learn a lot from observing right-wing politicians in Brazil. We'll pop over to this side of the room. What's your name and what's your question, please? Hi, my name is Mac. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, since at least World War I, uh, a lot of American foreign policy is often defined by our attempts to construct or preserve democracies abroad. So as we struggle with democracy at home, how do you imagine the future of that kind of core tenant of American foreign policy? All right, Daniel. Yeah, well, I think it's very hard to do it, um, uh, uh, to support democracy abroad when we have troubles at home. Um, but I think even more broadly, you know, one of the things I'm struck by in my travels in Europe and so on, where I spend a fair amount of time, is people sense that, uh, that they have a stake in, our, in what's happening in the United States. I mean, often in, in a, a small country that has a democratic collapse, you know, the elite of the country think they can flee the country and you know, come to send their, their kids to university in the United States or in Western Europe, and they can kind of you know, buy apartments in London and sort of find safe haven. You know, if democracy collapses in the United States, there is no safe haven. I mean, there's nowhere to go. I mean, we are, we are the kind of head, we're the place where people hedge too. Um, and, you know, it's for, so, you know, what this means for NATO, for instance, you know, and, you know, I, this is absolutely frightening to think about this, what this means for Russia's relationships to Europe. Uh, and, and other countries really are, are in, and people in other countries are looking to what's happening here, because if, if democracy can't survive in the United States, it, it genuinely is held up as a model. It, me, it means then that, that, you know, maybe other models are better. So I think it, there's, there's, there's really, it's a global, it's a, it's a struggle with global consequences. What's the real risk factor? Zero to five. Five democracy going to collapse. Zero. We are totally chill. Ask Where do you put it right now? Um, <laughs> yeah. So you know, I think that there are, there are a lot of sources of strength. So, I mean, you want me, you, I want, I'll give I you a number. a number. I'll give you a number. I'll give you a number. But let me just justify the number. <laughs> There's a lot of sources of strength in the United States, of resilience. Where the United States is not going to become Russia and Hungary, where the single party rule across the entire political system. Our, our federalism is of great strength. Our, we're a diverse, pluralistic society. Lots of wealth is based in places where, uh, you know, that don't support these kinds of movements. Think California, New York, Boston. So th th these are sources of resilience, but that doesn't mean we're safe. And so I know, it, so just because we're not going to become hungry in Russia, you know, I can't believe I'm saying this. That you know, it's not good news. That's not you know, that's not good news. Because I think what you can imagine is, in fact, incredible conflict, you know, and and dysfunction and instability. And in some sense, we're already living in it. Um, you know, the kind of dysfunction we see in Congress that we've asked talked about, the violence. I can imagine all of this taking on a larger scale in our, in, our, in our lives. And so what this means is living, and what this means for the economy is of, co of course great significance. So instability, violence, this is stuff that I think we potentially could look forward to. Um, and so this is certainly incredible. You know, some may regard this as optimistic, which I, I certainly do not regard this as optimistic. 
Right. Let me just highlight one thing Daniel said, which is we are already living in the crisis. We are living in a moment where Republican leaders say that they, they, won't, they can't vote to impeach Trump, not only because it might be bad for their political careers, but because they're worried for the physical health of their wife and children or their husband and children. And, uh, and we're at, at a point where prosecutors, judges, election officials across the country are under physical threat. We're already there. Well, that's nice. <laughs> Here. Thank you for the great talk tonight. My name is Eduardo. I'm a junior at the college from Brazil. And my question explores Professor Levitsky's point in a previous lecture that future reforms towards a multiracial democracy with less counter-majoritarian institutions will almost certainly require an, another wave of civic engagement uh, and civic protest. So my question is, what are the lessons that we can draw from the history of waves of civic engagement in the United States for us to inspire these reforms in the country? And is there any role that an institution like Harvard can, can play in this future waves of civic engagement towards these reforms? Thank you. Somebody forgot to filter out all my smartest ex-students. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, Edu. Um, one lesson which isn't, isn't the, maybe the happiest of lessons is that, these, that real reform, substantive reform, often takes a fair amount of time. Uh, it takes organization and mobilization over, in some cases, decades. Uh, the, 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 the fight for, uh, for female suffrage took many, many decades. Obviously, the struggle for civil rights in the United States took many decades, and often involves victories, defeats, getting up from defeats, learning from defeats, and, 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 and fighting again. That's why I think this sort of paying, uh, you know, putting too much stock in the next election is, is a mistake. No matter what happens in 2024, small d Democrats, people who believe in our democratic system and want to make it better, are going to have to get up and do the work. Um, I think we've also learned that um, that institutional, so people don't get out of bed on Saturday morning for the most part to push for institutional reform. There's got to be something else at the end of the rainbow. And so attaching institutional reform to things that we care about, things that young people in particular care about, whether it's racial justice or, uh, or fighting climate change or gun violence, um, making a connection between eliminating the filibuster and actually passing gun legislation, actually passing environmental legislation is very important. So institutional reform obviously is, is important in and of itself, but there has to be, people need a reason why we should be more democratic. Political scientists like Daniel and me, we're content with just becoming more democratic, but most people need a reason why. And so you have to attach a, 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 a vision for a, a, a better United States to that. I think in part, a vision for a, a successfully multiracial United States is, is part of it. And I personally think that the Black Lives Matter movement, that, be, that the protests in particular that began in 2020 are that sort of mobilization. What, at the end of the day, what that incredibly diverse, mostly young group of people, the largest protests by some measures in the history of the United States, what they were calling for was the essence of multiracial democracy, a state that protects everybody equally. Up here. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm a second year master in public policy student at the Kennedy School, and I'm actually taking class on democratic backsliding, and uh, your books are on the syllabus, so looking forward to getting to those. Um, what do you see as, uh, what do you see the role of voters is in their commitment to um, upholding, uh, you know, uh, political, um, uh, the, the three criteria you described and their a commitment to upholding political legitimacy. Um, I'm thinking about the 2022 midterms where a lot of election deniers lost, um, but uh, do you see that holding up in the future? Yeah, I think there are, the good news is um, that there are overwhelming majorities of Americans who support visions of a more inclusive uh, multiracial democracy that Steve was talking about, and also overwhelming majorities in favor of of a lot of these institutional reforms that people say are so unrealistic. I just saw a survey yesterday you know, saying that 70% of Americans think we should get rid of the Electoral College. And, and I think these midterm elections also show that people don't like election, people who don't, don't like these election deniers. 
years, right? I mean, so this is, this is good news. The, 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 the problem is that these minor, the, the kind of minority that does not uh, share those views has outsized role in our political system, number one. But number two, uh, there's a, you know, this is why voter turnout is so key. You know, there's a sense in which you know, if, people, if people vote, if there's high voter turnout, in general, you get outcomes that are more friendly to these kinds of uh, core democratic values. And so people need to understand, I think voters need to understand what's at stake. Um, you know, and so uh, Joe Biden's giving a speech, I guess, uh, tomorrow evening on democracy and threats to democracy. And I think, I think he you know, seems to be concerned about this. And I think the Democratic Party understands this. And so this is partly why this is an issue. And, and you know, it's kind of a crazy thing, though, in a democracy that democracy has to be on the ballot in effect. But in the situation that we're in, you know, this may, this may be necessary. So, but I think, you know, so we, we mostly talk about the role of political leaders, but it's absolutely critical as well that voters uh, remain committed to these values. And, I, and I, just a final point I would say is to not become disengaged. I mean, the greatest self-fulfilling prophecy is to think that your vote doesn't matter uh, and that nothing will change. And so, you know, because certainly by not voting, nothing will change. And so I think really trying to, trying to remain engaged, although it's very difficult, and that's why we think it's really critical that these reforms, you know, allow for an opportunity for things that people care about to get through, like gun control, climate change, and so on. But to keep engaged is obviously absolutely critical. Okay, so, and, and, and just briefly, because we I want to get to one more question, and yet, a recent uh, substantial poll has Donald Trump outstripping Joe Biden by nearly 10 percentage points. Washington Post poll last week, uh, black voters doubling in their support for Donald Trump, Hispanic and Latino voters at a 42% pro-Trump. How does that map to what you just said? Well, you know, there's, there's look, I mean, there's, there's, there, there, there's going to be change. I mean, in some sense, actually, the idea that the Republican Party becomes a more diverse party. I mean, this is one part of your question. There was a lot in your question. You know, this may be, in fact, a good thing. I mean, I think one of the dangers that we face today is that our parties are so racially polarized. Ultimately, I'm not sure if the questions were, will you support Trump, but there's also generally lots of evidence, or some evidence, that, that increasingly minority voters are supporting the Republican Party. At the end of the day, we, you know, it would be good news if both parties could reach majorities of Americans of all types. So that, you know, so that, that's one point. I think overall, I mean, it's going to be a close election. I mean, this is a two-party system, um, and so it's essentially a coin toss. I mean, we can't take anything for granted. And so, you know, people are, and, and polarization is very intense, and people vote for the Republican Party because they are Republicans and are, are kind of blind often to these abuses. That's part of the reason we wrote the book, is we want people to understand the threats and to understand that there's more than just your party winning, that there's more at stake. Okay. Let me scare you even further. <laughs> The, I mean, that, that 10-point that 10 poll is an outlier, but almost all polls now show the election tied, so there's real reason to, more or less tied, so it's reason to worry. But one thing that we're noticing in the last five years, especially post-COVID, everywhere, in democracies everywhere, across Latin America, across Europe, voters are angry. Voters are, are dissatisfied, they are pissed off, and they are voting almost every time against the incumbents. Voters, angry voters, particularly those who don't have a strong partisan affiliation, are voting against incumbents. And that is going to work to Trump's benefit in 2024. All right, let's try to get one last quick one in right up here. Thanks. Um, my name's Emily Litsis. I'm a grad student here at the Kennedy School. You pointed out two problems, identity politics and not trusting election results. Are there solutions that build trust in our institutions or that teach identity politics to a Republican group that engages them? Because right now I feel like those two things are also not uh, very clearly encompassed in a, a solution that reaches both parties. What do you mean by teaching, what do you mean by identity politics and teaching identity politics? Well, you pointed out earlier that a core problem here isn't uh, the majority voting uh, about, it's actually that people fear that with uh, a rising diversity that they're losing some type of rights or power in this system. Yeah. And the way that we overcome that, it sounds like maybe an assumption there is education, but that's been uh, something that's created some controversy in terms of how we teach on those issues. So is there a way of engaging the Republican Party in overturning some of that thinking? That is a great question. And I, I think if I knew the answer to that question, I would have a much better paying job somewhere. <laughs> it, it, it's a very important question. Um, 
a, a very large number of Trump voters, obviously not all of them, but many Trump voters feel like the country they grew up in is being taken away from them. That is that we are we are going through a, a really momentous change. No democracy ever has gone through a transition in which a dominant ethnic group loses its not only numerical majority, but its dominant social status. That transition has never been never happened in a democracy. We will be the first if we get out to the other side. And so we don't know. We, don't, we can't go to other democracies and draw lessons for how to do that. None of us quite know how to do that. I think a, a couple of things. I, I think actually the most important players here and the most important teachers here are Republican Party leaders themselves. Um, I don't think it's, it, uh, there's been a lot of educational initiatives, efforts by blue state progressives to, to you know, teach people that diversity is great. And I, I'm not, I think Republican leaders are going to have to tell their base. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if, the, if the transformation of the electorate in the way that you were, you were pointing to continues, Republican leaders will have an incentive to do that. But they need to tell their base rather than uh, you know, demagoguery and, and uh, you know, repeating Tucker Carlson's BS uh, about uh, uh, the Great Replacement, if Republican leaders would actually speak to their base uh, about the state of the United States in 2023, we would be better off. So, they, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we so got, yeah, just, what, yeah, so we're at, but, you know, more generally, I think we have a, a line in our book where we say Americans need to learn to love their country with a broken heart. And what that means is that this sort of dichotomy that we you know, love America or we just despise our America and you know, condemn everything about our history is a totally fa false dichotomy. And all Americans, blue Americans, red Americans, need to understand that to, to love America means to confront our own history. And this is something that applies to everybody. And on that note, please join me in thanking the professors for a wonderful conversation.